kids love him. My family all loves this dog. And to see this happen is just horrible. A pet owner's worst nightmare. Your beloved companion shot numerous times, but it's who allegedly did the shooting and the circumstances surrounding it that have people talking. TV5 Sherry Hartman, live and local with this story tonight. Sherry, what does the owner say happened? Jonathan, police don't have to look far to find the person responsible. The family says the person who shot and killed their beloved pet was a police officer. I heard a pop, 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 and I was like, what is going on? So I stood up and looked out this window right here on my house, and I see the St. Louis Police Department standing over my dog that's all bloodied, laying right here. Brian Getzinger is describing the shocking scene he saw in his backyard around 3 this afternoon. His beloved Golden Retriever Scout had been shot. The cop came out, opened up my gate, the dog came out, he cornered him right over here, and the dog growled at him. So he shot him, or he shot once, and then the dog ran over here, and that's where he emptied his firearm out, right here in my lawn. Lori Wansley was visiting her mother, who lives across the street from the family. She says the dog was in her mother's yard for just a few minutes before it headed back home and ran into the officer. It wasn't provoked. It wasn't warranted. He just started shooting him. He just kept shooting him in the head. And I saw it like six or eight times, and, and I, just, I just couldn't believe it. And I said, what are you doing? I said, he's just a puppy. I just couldn't believe that, let alone the police were in my yard shooting anything, let alone my dog, who is sweet. He's been our family pet for at least eight years. We've had him since he was a puppy. My daughter sleeps with him periodically, and he's just the nicest dog. He's never attacked anyone ever. So I just couldn't understand why someone would shoot him. Still alive, the dog was rushed to the vet, but later died. Getzinger says the family is devastated. They're, they're sad, you know. It's our, been our family pet for a long time, so. We put in a call to the St. Louis Police Department. We have not heard back from them. The family says that they will file a complaint in the morning and are considering legal action. Reporting live in St. Louis, Sherry Harpin, WNEM TV5. All right, thank you, Sherry. We'll be working tomorrow to get some sort of statement on the incident from St. Louis Police. Surveillance footage from a security camera allegedly captured the LAPD arresting Michelle Jordan, who was pulled over for using her cell phone, mind you. See, this is why we can't have all these stupid laws that allow the cops just to pull people over indiscriminately because shit like this happens. This is the problem with 8 million laws. The security cameras from a Del Taco parking lot to Hunda shows two officers slamming a woman twice on the ground. Jordan, who's 34, was allegedly using her cell phone when LAPD proceeded with a routine stop. She pulled into the parking lot at a local restaurant where she got out of the car and confronted the officers. She was booked on resisting arrest and later released. LAPD Chief Charlie Book stated that Proper steps were taken, including appropriate notifications and removal of the involved officers on the field. So basically what he's saying is that, oh, well, they, they were uh, sent on vacation, paid vacation. According to the LAPD, both officers have been assigned to desk duties until further investigation. So they get to sit around and twill their freaking thumbs getting paid, you know, seventy five, eighty five, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 a year. Give me a break. The officers are described as a 22-year veteran and a 10-month probationary officer. Now, imagine that. 22-year veteran. Do you imagine how many times he's done this shit and hasn't got caught? If it wasn't for these surveillance cameras from Del Taco, they would have got away with this stuff. People that actually live in this county and in the state can kind of see this further away. No, but but I can't do that. Uh, well, for the California Vehicle Code, say that word or Excuse me, California Vehicle Code, this number. You have to live in this county. Work or leave. You have to live in this county. Work or leave in no. this California Vehicle Code. That's something you can do on your own. I'm sorry, I can't. If you don't sign a ticket, you go to jail. I don't want to go to jail. I want to talk with your supervisor. I would like to talk with your supervisor. No, you can sign a ticket. You're in no position to I'm, request orders on me. I, Tell your, your friend to get the camera out of my face. I don't want to give you a request or Step orders. Step out of the truck. 
Can you in the rear passenger, you're not involved with this, so stay out of it. how this works. When an officer hands you a ticket and you refuse to sign, I did, either, I wait, 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 if you refuse to sign either due to the fact that you're, you don't believe you either committed the violation, you believe the officer is incorrect or whatever the case may be, the moment you refuse to sign that, what it tells us is we're going to end up taking you to the, take you to the local magistrate. It's 445. The courts have already closed. The last court case is at 4.30. So what would happen is if you refuse to sign the ticket, and I'm not trying to threaten you, if you refuse to sign a ticket, you will sit in a jail cell until tomorrow morning when you can see a judge. And all that the judge is going to do is basically say you refuse to sign the ticket, and he's going to tell you report back to this court at this date, and he'll assign a court date right then and there. Okay? There's ways you can deal with this. If he doesn't want to give you the county seat, you request the county seat through the courts. If the officer's already written the ticket out, he can amend it, but the I'm going to ask him if he can give you the county seat. It's not a big deal. What's going to happen is he's going to have to give you an amendment in the mail because he's already finished the ticket. Can I talk to you? Okay. The other thing is when I come trying to figure out what's going on, I don't know what's going on with him and I don't know what's going on with you. But when I'm trying to ask questions and you interrupt, it doesn't help. Okay? We're on a timetable. Normally, when I call for an additional unit, someone's going to jail because now they're delaying me. Okay? He's not doing that. So consider yourself lucky, okay? Now, what did you want to ask me? Okay. I appreciate, first of all, that you are not shouting more to me because that really was very scared to me, the way that you were talking to me. I wanted to say several things. The first thing, I never refused to sign the ticket. Okay. I told him, you know, that call the supervisor because I asked him several times to the county seat and he was telling me that it was not necessary the county seat because I don't live here and I told him in the code 40502B for California Vehicle Code. 4300B. Say that person that lives or works here, and they the have seat. the right to have the county seat. And yeah. I told him, but let problem, me finish. But, I, but the I let you is finish. You have no proof. Let me finish. You have no proof, let me finish. I let you finish talk. I let you finish talk. Then I'm beginning to lose my patience again, and you're about ready to go to jail. Is that what you want today? I don't want to do that. I only well, wanted to explain you. This. We got things to do other than stand here and babysit and dawdle. Okay? <laughs> Give you the county seat. If he gives you the county seat, will you sign the ticket? Yes. Of course. Okay. If not, I'll have my supervisor come and he's basically going to say, take you to jail. No, I that's, haven't said That's what I we're down to. Okay? Him stop, the stop, supervisor. stop. Conversation's over. That's what we're down to. We're down to brass tacks. We don't have time to BS around with this. I ask you a simple question, you go in this big, long dissertation. I don't care. The only thing I care about is we get out of here in a timely manner. And we're, we're already teetering on that edge of now we're being delayed. Okay. He to shout to me, and I told him that I don't like that attitude. Mm -hmm. And then he told me to sit down, and then I sit down. But he knew that I was right. Mm -hmm. Which one, the first one or the second no, one? No, the second one, because the first one keeps saying that I wanted to. He he said in the radio, mm -hmm. he said three lies. Mm -hmm. The first one, he said that he was following and chasing me for ten minutes. That that's not true. Mm -hmm. The second, he said that I was. Um, that I was refusing to sign the ticket when I was never refusing uh -huh. to sign the ticket. Uh -huh. I was asking to talk with the supervisor uh -huh. several times. Uh -huh. And when the guy came, they didn't let me explain anything. Uh -huh. They only said, shut up, shut up. I heard that, yeah. And shouting. Uh -huh. And, and said, then I yeah. told them, you guys are scaring me a lot. Uh -huh. That no way to talk to me. You are mm -hmm. scaring me. Mm -hmm. I don't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. I feel very bad, and I would like to talk to the supervisor. Mm -hmm. And they were mad. Mm -hmm. And then right now he's talking normal, and I say I appreciate that you're not showing to me. But mm -hmm. but they're threatening you. Yeah, they are. Threatening me. To, because you asked for the county seat, they're threatening to arrest you for asking for the county seat. It's incredible, yeah. wicked, evil, nasty. Wicked, satanic 
satanic inspired thugs is what they are they're not even public servants at all they're not Christian at all they're not good at all they're not decent at all they're wicked you know but Yes. Come on back. The officer said I'm in the ticket, so you're going to get a thing in the mail in about two weeks showing the county seat. Okay? Wow, it wasn't that difficult, was it? No. They didn't threaten to arrest you again for asking no. for it? And they say, if you are asking for the county seat because you think that I'm not going to show, uh -huh. you're in trouble because I will be there. He said you're in trouble? Yeah, he said that. You're in trouble because I will be there no matter what happened, I will be there. Uh -huh. And I have a camera in my, in my, in my, co in my car. Uh -huh. That's the one that told me to turn off the camera, said he has a camera? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Have a camera and tell that guy about... I'm, tell that guy I'm, what? I'm not scared about that camera. He's not scared about the camera? Yeah. Is that what he said? Then why do you keep asking me to turn it off? Or trying to demand I turn it off? He said, I have my own camera. He said what? I have my own camera in the, co in the car. Good. <laughs> what did they say about turning around? Uh, he said, go like one mile here. And then I need to like to pass like the like the rats. Mm -hmm. and then to, to that I'm sorry, honey, that happened. You did a good job though. They're evil, huh? Yes, they are. <sighs> yeah. mm -hmm. And he was he, he told you to say something about the camera and to tell him about yeah. tell the guy about the camera. I have a camera or something like that. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Pathetic. You're pathetic. Yep. We continue with 2020's Out of Bounds. Once again, Matt Gutman. North Carolina, where tobacco is king and traffic laws reign with an iron fist. Go 15 miles an hour over the limit here, you will get your license suspended and you could land in jail. Police here are sworn to enforce these tough laws, but we wondered, do they actually obey them too? To find out, we decided to turn the tables on the cops with our own 2020 speed trap in Raleigh, North Carolina. We're gonna be along this road. Our objective, not only to catch any speeding cops in the act, to all be 
on walkie-talkies, but to follow them to their final destination. Our target location, a stretch of I-40 near downtown Raleigh, but the speed limit is 65 miles per hour. We deploy our surveillance team, starting with Ron Carr. Remember, he's the guy who's been documenting speeding cops in Raleigh for months now. His job is to alert us to any fast-moving squad car heading our way. White Knox Charger, left lane. Actually, he's running hot. To accurately measure how fast any suspected speeding cops are traveling, three, two, one, mark. We set up two checkpoints. Three, two, one, mark. The plan is if we confirm cops are speeding, we'll spring our trap, deploying my chase guard to tell them wherever they're going. Even though we chose something with some hefty horsepower, we don't want to get busted for speeding ourselves. So in case we lose them, where did he go? We brought in the Air Cavalry, a 2020 helicopter equipped with an aerial surveillance camera. Those cops can run, but they can't hide from our eye in the sky. The 2020 speed trap is set, and it's not long till this cruiser flies by our checkpoints at 75 miles per hour. Mark, that's 10 over the limit. No lights, no sirens. By the time the cruiser reaches us in the chase car, we estimate it's picked up even more speed. It's going about 85. It's hard for us to catch up. My chase car is left in the dust, but luckily, our chopper team gets us right back on track. We are on it. Chopper's on it. It says SBI Crime Lab. We're able to follow the car to its final destination and confront the lead-footed driver. Uh, Matt Gutman from ABC News. Hi. How you been? I'm good. Good. Um, we were watching you on I-40. Okay. We're going about 85 miles an hour. Okay. Wondering what you think about that. Uh, I don't really have a comment. You don't have a comment? No. It's hardly an emergency. The back? officer is just Bring dropping off you. evidence at the state crime lab. Don't you think it's a little hypocritical that police officers go 85 miles an hour and they would clearly pull someone like me over? That would upset people. Isn't what you're supposed to do, to some extent, serve as an example of how people should drive? So stand by, this guy's moving. Astonishingly, the cops kept coming, zooming by us, smashing speed laws to take care of non-emergency business. He's cooking. Like the sheriff's deputy who hits 85 miles per hour, that's 20 over the limit. We're able to follow the deputy all the way downtown, where we discover there's no emergency. She was just apparently late for an appointment at the courthouse. All right, she is pulling into the official intake vehicles only. We can't do that. She's running hot. Same story with another sheriff's vehicle that we clock at 82 miles per hour. He's going so fast. He's going 82. Stay at him. Chopper, stay at him. Everybody stay at him. He's moving too fast for me to keep up with. Oh, man, we just lost him. Finally, our trusty chopper again comes to the rescue and puts us back on his tail. The officer leads us on a merry, slow-speed chase through Raleigh's downtown streets. He's going around in circles. He is aware we're following him. I think he's trying to shake us. He finally comes to a stop at the federal courthouse. We're from ABC News. Uh, we noticed that on I-40 over there, you were going about 82, 85. Wondering if you were uh, on an emergency call. Actually, we didn't see the flashers. Think of a uh, federal prisoner taking back to County. I don't know. If I went 81 or 82, you'd probably pull me over. I would. You think your, your superior would mind that you were going that fast? Would he mind? Probably. Two, one, mark. But not all of the cops we caught speeding were on official business. Check out this officer cruising by at 79 miles per hour. Our helicopter crew tracks him as he exits the highway and follows him to, you're not going to believe this, a donut shop. And Dunkin' Donuts wasn't the only eye-opening destination we discovered Mark, the course of our surveillance op. Check out this highway patrol SUV speeding 75 miles per hour. I see him. By the time he gets to us in the chase car, we estimate it's going even faster. So this guy's going well over 80 right now. The middle lane. Tearing across lanes just to get to his exit. Oh, wow. He did three lanes at once. He did three lanes without using his blinkers, ladies and gentlemen. We're able to catch up on a local road, but again, he punches the accelerator. You guys, this guy's going 70 and a 45 right now. We finally find out where the trooper was headed in such an all-fire hurry. Incredibly, he was speeding just to get to the Highway Patrol Training Academy. This place even has its own driver's training course. So, we're doing a story about yep. speeding cops, and we noticed you were going about... Oh, 80 miles an hour on the highway, and then about 75 and a 45. We had a hard time keeping up with you. Yeah, I was trying to get over here this morning. The concern is that, you know, 
police officers speeding. A lot of folks want to see you set an example, and uh, if you're going about 15, 20 miles over the speed limit, there might be some concern. I don't understand what you're saying. If you're wondering what subject this officer teaches here, take a look at his shirt. Yep, that's right. He's a driving instructor. Hey, gentlemen, how are you? Time to get some answers. We walk into the training academy with cameras rolling. Let me get to step inside. Sure. But none of the supervisors on site are willing to talk. You're not even curious about what your guys are doing, the guys who are speeding to get here to work for you? Sir, I'm not even at liberty to discuss this with you. Later, after we've left North Carolina, a spokesman for the Highway Patrol tells us they've launched an investigation into what we found. We went ahead and started looking into this matter, and we're going to handle it accordingly. Do you find it outrageous that one of the people we found driving most recklessly seemed to be a driving instructor? That, that's not a good thing. It kind of paints the wrong type of message. We are dealing with that individual. But in Connecticut, what we found during our surveillance operation came as no surprise to the families of teenagers Ashley Krakowski and David Servant who lost their lives because of a speeding cop. Today, they rest side by side. The tragedy has left their families deeply skeptical that cops will actually crack down on their own. And never in a million years will they do that, ever. Would you say that these speeding cops destroyed your family? Yes, they did ours. They their hearts out. They did, and it could be anybody's kid, anybody's child, and it's the worst thing you could ever happen to you. Our hearts go out to both of those families tonight. How is it possible this truck driver ended up in a trauma hospital? We investigate why a local man who committed no crime was nearly killed over a traffic ticket. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Raj Mathai. And I'm Jessica Aguirre. It is a citizen's worst nightmare pulled over by a cop on a remote road and you end up in a trauma hospital after a disagreement over a simple traffic ticket. It happened to a Bay Area resident on his way home on I-80. We've been investigating the story for six months and it doesn't seem to add up. What we do know though is this man's life was changed forever. Let's bring in investigative reporter Stephen Stock. And Stephen, how cooperative has the CHP been in this? Well, Raj, we asked for public records back in February and have yet to receive any public records from California's Highway Patrol. Its own Internal Affairs Division says there's been a 17 percent jump in the number of disciplinary actions against CHP officers in the last five years. But they won't talk in detail about this case because the truck driver involved is now suing the Highway Patrol and the officers involved. So we went digging on our own and uncovered a story we found very hard to believe. It all happened around 5.30 in the morning on a remote part of the interstate up in the Sierra Mountains, far away from any witnesses. We want to warn you, parts of this story and some of the pictures you're about to see may disturb you. Fifty-eight-year-old Kazachenko can retell with clear precision the moments from that morning back on September 2, 2011, out on Interstate 80, westbound out of Reno, headed home to the Bay Area. He speaks in his native language, Russian, recounting up until that moment of the incident. That's when Oleg's Kazachenko goes silent and cannot speak anymore. For 40 minutes, Kozachenko sits there, insisting he wants to tell his story, but the words won't come. But these pictures speak for him, confirmed by medical records, a crushed left orbital eye socket, multiple facial fractures, a broken left arm, loss of consciousness, a concussion, possible neurological damage. Why did this happen? According to court records, it was all because Kozachenko would not sign a ticket, citing him for driving his truck for too many hours. The truck driver says he wanted to read the ticket first. So the court records show Highway Patrol Officer Andrew P. Murrell forcibly arrested him. In court testimony and in the initial report filed along with the ticket, the 220-pound Highway Patrolman Murrow said the six-foot-tall, 165-pound Kozachenko was actively resisting and exhibited extraordinary strength. And they finally give him this citation. They Stuart Katz is Kozachenko's attorney. He tries to tell him that, hey, I'm not violating the logbook. 
According to the initial report filed by Officer Murrell, he and fellow officer Jim Sherman pulled over Kozachenko after getting a report of a sleepy driver. These pictures taken by officers on the scene after the confrontation with Officer Murrell show a bloodied Kozachenko lying on the side of the highway, his hands cuffed behind his back. He's punched, his arm gets broken, they're on top, he's face down, his ribs get fractured, uh, they're cutting off the oxygen for a significant period of time. Officers charged Kozachenko with driving over hours and DUI, but both those charges were dropped. A blood alcohol test came back at zero, totally clean. White powder seized by the officers from his cab turned out to be table salt. Finally, officers charged Kozachenko with misdemeanor resisting, obstructing, or delaying a peace officer. That was dismissed after a judge threw out the evidence after a defense motion and testimony about what happened on the freeway. The only time I've seen worse injuries as a result of police actions are when someone uh, was shot. I think seven bullets hit him. We called and went to Andrew Murrow's work office to get his side of the story. But each time he said he could not talk on advice of his lawyer. His attorney said there would be no comment other than to deny all charges in the civil suit. In his response to that civil suit filed in court, Murrell contends, quote, the force employed was reasonable and not excessive. How is it possible this truck driver ended up in a trauma hospital? Well, again, the, uh, there's ongoing litigation in the case. I can't discuss uh, why it is that he suffered the injuries to the extent that he did. Acting Chief no, Ken Hill, who oversees the Valley Division of CHP, which includes Merle's squad, could not address specifics of the case because of the lawsuit. But he says he reviews every use of force incident by an officer. And in this particular case, I don't remember. Um, it wasn't something that jumped out as me and being, oh my gosh, uh, we have some serious issues here. Does the public out there have anything to fear from your officers? I will tell you this, if the public, when they get stopped, they simply comply with what they're asked to do, they have nothing to fear, nothing to fear at all. Hill says every CHP officer goes through extensive training in the academy. We obtained records showing Merle was also a licensed fist boxer while at Fort Hood. I promise you that our officers are not out there beating people up for without any justified reason. And I'm not saying that we beat people up. What I'm saying is sometimes their actions, um, their actions cause us to have to escalate a particular use of force to be able to take them into custody, to protect ourselves, to protect the members of the public. Whatever happened out there that morning, nearly two years later, it still clearly haunts Oleg's Kozachenko. Justice would certainly involve the CHP taking a hard look and seeing whether either of these people should be driving around with a badge and a gun. As for whether or not there was any internal affairs investigation, punishment, or retraining, the CHP simply won't say, citing the law enforcement officer's Bill of Rights. According to statistics from CHP's Internal Affairs Division, the Valley Division, where Merle works, led the state in the number of disciplinary actions against officers in 2011, the year this happened. We can say that Officer Merle continues to work for California's Highway Patrol. As for Oleg Kozachenko, because of his injuries, he no longer works, and his family is seeking both financial and medical help for him. Re Jessica, Raj. Okay, thank you.